Alex is the most average kid in school who's just gotten himself a smoking hot new girlfriend. Too bad she's the prom queen from hell. We watched Prom Night 3, The Last Kiss, today on... The f*** is this? <laughs> So I have a question, mm. Jameson. Uh oh. I it's you know, you're right to to be worried. Uh, I, I usually have, am I have a, <laughs> when you, I have, when you I have a spring question. these on me. Yeah, I don't ahead. think it's necessarily a great way to open the show, but it's a question that's been on my mind for the past couple of days, and I feel like the world needs an answer for it. Okay. So I just want to get your opinion on this. So I've been doing a lot of texting over twi- uh, Tinder mm. lately. I almost said Twitter, but like uh, a tw- tw- Twinder. Which is a dating app where there's only twins. Get on with it, Kaz. What do you want to to, ask me? I had to create a fake twin for myself. So I was was texting this one guy, and he sent me the eggplant emoji. Mm -hmm. And I know that the eggplant emoji is supposed to be a dick, but I saw that, and I immediately started thinking, if the eggplant emoji is a dick, does that mean Baba Ganoush has come? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, then yeah. I'm glad that we. I'm glad we answered that. All right. Oh well. Good. We're, we're glad we got that out. Of I the mean, way that's now. that's that's my improv training. Where they say like, yes, and you're correct. <laughs> I mean, you're technically correct. That is what you're supposed to do in that situation. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I thought you'd be more disappointed in me. I am disappointed. I, in okay. You. <laughs> but you're just you're just used to it by now. You're just numb. Yeah. To these type of situations, I can't shock you. After anymore. however many episodes of this, is I'm thinking like, oh god, Kaz is still up to his old tricks. Well. And he, He's slipping a little. <laughs> I'm gonna keep trying. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Try, I'm gonna try and shock you by the end of this episode. You don't have to try very hard. Like I am always like, constantly amazed at what I've gotten myself into. <laughs> and yet you've st- You've stuck at it for three years, and I. I appreciate. I'm in that. it for the long haul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back. However, you wish to self-identify. Die to the fright is this, where we die through DVD bins, sort through streaming apps. Oh, I should say, sort through screaming apps. I just thought I just thought oh, that right now. Fuck, oh, three that's years great. into this, and like uh, we just now <laughs> bought like the perfect to, to, fi- to find the weird, <laughs> the bizarre, and the unloved. I'm your host, Kaz Less Scared, and joining me always is my host, Gravison Rafter. Oh, Gravison. <laughs> We've well, done this joke. We've done this joke in season did. one, but I it's, I don't know, it's the last episode of Two Months of Halloween Spooktacular, and I just, uh, I, just I, I don't know, I'm not... The weekend following, like, the Thanksgiving long weekend Yeah, Canada exactly, there. I couldn't... There's no puns left. There's no puns left associated with our names. We blew through all of them in the first year. Would you say it's and... not as pun anymore? Now I'm the one. All right. Now I'm the one. Now, <laughs> now I'm you the... know what it's like! Now I'm the one who's disappointed. <laughs> All right. Taste your own medicine. (laughs) Feels good. Well, we've got a movie to talk about today because we always got a movie to talk about today because that is the central premise of the show. On the last episode, which funnily enough might be the next episode, (laughs) given how we're currently having some uh, technical difficulties and uh, that episode may release later, but uh, if that's how it ends up working, spoiler for next episode. So the last episode we recorded was Howling 3, The Marsupials, which was a sequel to Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf, aka Howling 2, Sturbo Werewolf Bitch, which was a a very fun episode. It was fantastic. It's a shame you guys might never be able to listen to it oh it was <laughs> we can just like don't hype, say that we can hype no we can really hype this up as we're, gonna, we're gonna release it <laughs> we can say anything form. we want about this one <laughs> it was yes we, we solved uh, world peace so mm-hmm. we we uh, came up with the cure to covid it was jack great. black showed up jack and... black uh, ba- <laughs> bowser king of koopas himself yeah absolutely youtube's jack black and it's I don't know. I've just been watching a lot of Jack Black as Bowser memes lately, so oh. he's, he's YouTube's, he's YouTube's <laughs> Jack Black. Yeah, that's the thing he's I'm most concerned. known for. <laughs> but look, <laughs> since we've already kind of established ourselves as a podcast that already sort of picks through the dumpster of how did this get made its leftovers, I thought perhaps we might do another threequel to a sequel that how did this get made already covered. One of their best episodes, in my opinion, one of the funniest episodes, the episode they did on Hello Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. I thought uh, today, uh, you know, you know what, uh, since we're already uh, following uh, meagerly in the footsteps of a podcast run by people who are much more talented and successful than either of us are, uh, today's movie is Prom Night 3, The Last Kiss. 
And to help us talk about it, we have a fantastic guest. He's an actor and an improviser who's part of the live Vancouver soap opera Sin Peaks. And he's also a YouTuber and Twitch streamer under the name Cory Cola. Cory Bolio! Welcome, buddy. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Welcome I back to the apartment it. that you subletted for a month. Oh. I, you, well, yeah. I actually was good roommates with Bud the Cat here, who loves to be a part of things. And that was probably one of my best roommate experiences I've ever had. So thank you for that. He's the best roommate I've ever had. Yeah, he's, he's not that quiet, uh, and he doesn't always pick up after himself. In fact, he uh, often leaves uh, vomit and poo uh, all over the rug. Yeah, but what roommate doesn't? I, that's true, <laughs> yes. He, he doesn't throw all night cocaine parties, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he always does his dishes. So. Yeah. How, how have you been, sir? How have things been for you? Well, you know, it's COVID time. So is it? It's still? Is it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. I, I just news, just, to, news to me. I just looked out the window. Still COVID. Uh, so, you know, I've been dealing with that. It's been its own challenge, but, I mean, part of that has also been good. Like, it, there's been silver linings to all this, and it's been giving me good opportunities to have more time to pursue the things that I want to do right now. So, it's a little bit of bad, it's a little bit of good, but I've been focusing and pursuing the good. So, not too bad is the all-around answer there. Excellent. That's a wonderful perspective. <laughs> you gotta find the silver lining in crappy situations. And oh, we, yeah. We've been oh, yeah. in a crappy situation going on three years now, so... Uh, You're talking about our podcast? Lots of silver linings. <laughs> it is funny. If we, if we had started this podcast in 2020, we, there, oh. would be, there would be evidence to support the fact that we caused COVID, so... <laughs> Luckily. So, Corey, you're a, a horror fan. I feel like that that's fair to say. I am, you are a whore. I am. Well, yes to Well, both. he's an actor, so yes. That's, yes that goes without saying. Ooh. Yes. I am a horror and a horror fan. You're a, whor I, you're a whore for horror. Yeah, I'm a horror for horror, and I'm a whore of horror. I love playing horror games. I love watching horror TV shows. I love watching horror movies. So, yeah, I'm very much engrossed in the kind of overall horror scene. And, like, I think, like many people who, who do love horror, the worse the movie is, usually the better. We have proven that to be not the case all the time. We've on this podcast several times. There is a fine line. There is definitely a fine line where you go from good bad to bad bad. For oh, sure. Yes. For sure. All right, well, give us some examples. What, what, what are some of your favorite good bad movies within the horror genre? So, good bad. Oh, my God. Have you seen Drag Me to Hell? Oh, yes. Ooh. Absolutely. That's um, <laughs> Sam Raimi, right? Sam Raimi's last foray into the horror genre has a depressingly bleak ending. The whole movie is just, I think the director just slapping this actress in the face mm -hmm. for a full, I think two hours the movie is, just slap, slap, slap. And putting her in not only like scary situations, but demeaning situations. Like, oh, oh, the old lady's teeth fell out and they're in your mouth now. I think that happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. and the character is really the character doesn't deserve anything that happens to her. No. She's a fairly nice person. She gets inflicted by the gypsy's curse kind of on a misunderstanding, and it's a very mean spirited movie. And they're like, Yeah, fuck you, bitch, you deserve everything that's <laughs> you deserve happening. Everything that's happening to you. You're just standing there going, like, not really, she's kinda nice. And uh, the interesting thing about that, uh, Alison Lohman is the actress, so after that movie, she kind of stopped acting. One one really? wonders Whoa. if she wasn't dragged to hell. Wow. Well, yeah. well, has anyone checked on her? She actually <laughs> actually married one of the guys who directed Crank. Oh. oh. So and, she and, is and, in hell. And pops up in Boom! Insert rim shot here. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, as you mentioned, you're also a Twitch streamer and you play a lot of horror games. Uh, mm. One of the games that I've uh, glimpsed you playing is uh, Dead by Daylight, uh, yeah, yeah. which is uh, looks to be a very fun game. Uh, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm stuck in the past, so I've, I haven't played... I I haven't played a video game past like 1999, Tekken. probably. Yeah, Tekken. Yeah, yeah. Tekken. Yeah, Tekken Three. Yeah. Tekken Three was the most recent game that I played. Very good. But it, it looks a lot of fun, and it fulfills a, a dream that I've always wanted to see in a video game. You get to play as a classic movie slashers. Absolutely. So, like the game, the premise. There's lots of uh, original killers in the game, but they also deal with a lot of licensed killers. The mm. the lore behind the game is that. That there's this thing known as simply the entity no one really knows much about it but it can pluck survivors and killers from anywhere in basically time and space uh, like hey you live in my realm now and you're gonna play these weird trials by my rules have fun being here and dying over and over for eternity and that gives them a lot of freedom to have licensed killers in the game so you got original killers but you also got like Freddy you have, you have Leatherface, you have the Demogorgon from Stranger Things, and you know, the list goes 
on, but not too much longer because there's only 23 characters. But yeah, absolutely. Just a fantastic premise for a game. Because I've always, as you know, as a fan of horror franchises myself, I've always thought we've seen Jason Voorhees in a, in a variety of different situations. But I've always thought, you know, like what if, to that point, like what if there was some sort of supernatural entity that was just kind of like fucking with the fabric of space and time? And what if Jason was just transported? to, like, the middle of a shopping mall. You know, like, you're just minding your own business and then all of a sudden Jason's just there and there'd be, like, a moment where he's trying to figure out what the hell's going on and then he would just start hacking well, the shit out of people and, I don't know, it would be a fantastic scene in a movie. What's funny about that is that if today's times are any indication to how that would pan out, a lot of people wouldn't panic. No. In fact, they would probably want to go and get pictures with him not knowing it's the real actual slasher. They start making TikToks. They, yeah. And the thing is, they, he'd probably kill like at least 20 people before the crowd started to catch on. Yeah. Maybe this isn't like a performance mm. or a show. That's starting to smell and look pretty realistic. Yeah, we're very desensitized by yeah. these sort of things now. I remember several years ago, I was acting in a, a live interactive zombie play where uh, <laughs> groups of people uh, got to be ushered around by actors to different locations around Vancouver. And my job was to be a fully made up zombie hiding behind a car. And when the group walked by, I, I would uh, jump out and I would, you know, shamble towards them. And I was sort of like the first infected that they saw. And then, you know, like the actor would be all like, oh, we gotta go. And, you know, you, you did that like... Uh, five times throughout a uh, performance of the evening. There were no stipulations made for rain, so I, 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 I quit on the second night because I realized uh, that's some bullshit. But the first yeah. night that I did it, I, you know, I was waiting behind the car, and you know, we're just out in the open. You know, everyone's walking by doing their thing, and I'm, I'm resetting, and I'm going back to the place where I'm supposed to wait, and I, I just pass like a regular businessman, and I'm in full zombie makeup, you know, like blood all over my face. I'm shambling by. I'm still in character, and this guy, he looks up at me it's just like oh this is a zombie and then he just kept, and he just kept going it's he's, just, like, he's yeah. just going going on his way i mean yeah you see you see the walking dead uh, every day in vancouver sadly yeah. so uh yeah uh, we're just comp we're, we're, we're a desensitized culture that reminds me of yearly pre-pandemic the uh the amusement park in vancouver playland would have these fright nights and they would have people dressed up as like creepy clowns and zombies going up and startling carnival goers past guest and friend of the podcast stephen beaver did that for three years solid oh wow wow Good for him. He loved it. He, he, it, it, it looks like a great gig, yeah. but like, like my hat goes off to anybody who can get a scare or any kind of reaction out of my good buddy Blake, who is like a massive like horror movie buff and fan. And every time that he would uh, go there and like people would jump out like Bleh! at him, he just like looked at him stone faced. You could not get a reaction out of him. The most you would ever get from him would be like, "All right, <laughs> <laughs> cool." <laughs> Shout out to my buddy Blake. How you doing? <laughs> Those people are the best. No, no offense to your to your friend, but like, oh, he's you know, awesome. Like, but like... Buy, buy the ticket, take the ride. Mm -hmm. You know, like even even just like pretend. Well, a little at least bit. giggle. But yeah. to, like he like he wants to be scared, but like nothing really gets to him. So like more often than not, when you're around him, you kind of feel safer. <laughs> <laughs> they need like one haunted house at Playland where it's just doing your taxes or like going to the bank and like you know like 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 worry, <laughs> worrying about like your financial stability, your future, and. They like that they, like, like instead of instead of a house of mirrors it's a house of bank statements and you just keep turning like yeah. ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I go to the, <laughs> the amusement park to like for escapism to get away from my real life. It's like, <laughs> just like the room of like online dating apps where like you, you start like a conversation and it seems like it's going really well and then they just disappear <laughs> and they just like stop talking to you and it's just that over and over I again. I was ghosted in real life. It's the ghost house. <laughs> <laughs> well, because uh, Corey, uh, you uh, played this game that uh, features a variety of slasher movie killers, uh, I thought we would look at a movie that has an unsung slasher movie killer who tried to make a stab at it, uh, mm -hmm. as it were, uh, but uh, never really uh, got off of the ground. So um, before this moment today, I know the answer, but I'm just going to, for the purposes of the podcast, I'm just going to ask it anyway. Had, uh, were either of you familiar with the Prom Night series of films? God, no. I had no absolute clue that they existed, and I'm now cursed with that knowledge but it, welcome to my life <laughs> it was a wild ride i haven't seen the first or the second one but i also don't think that was totally necessary in watching the third one either 
Uh, I'm only familiar of it because, Kaz, you, uh, I don't know how familiar you were with, with like, the first Prom Night, but you've been, like, talking up the praise of Prom Night 2 all year, so... Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2 is a fantastic fucking movie. It is genuinely great. It is 100% a camp classic. It has just some fantastically creative set pieces. It's wild as hell. It, it has, like, a, a weird streak of humor, uh, and it has a great central villain in Mary Lou Mahoney, who, uh, the best way to describe her is Freddy Krueger meets Carrie. In Prom Night 2, the opening scene, she's she's a slut and she's proud of it. She she loves to get with uh, all the guys in the school and and she's just like a mega queen bitch number one and, and she's proud of that fact. And on the night of the prom where she's being crowned the prom queen, uh, she goes to prom with one guy and then jilts him and, and goes with another guy. Uh, and then to get revenge, first guy lights a, a stink bomb and throws it at her. But the stink bomb malfunctions, sets her dress on fire and uh, sets right. Sends her, burns her up, burns her up into flames, and then she comes back uh, as an as an evil ghost who possesses uh, the um, the the heroine of that movie. It's fantastic. I recommended it to both of you. It sounds like neither of you got the chance to check it out. Though. Uh, oh, I, I watched it last night. You I, did. I did. Yeah. You, what, what are your thoughts on Prom Night Two? Now that you've seen it, now that you've seen both. Eh. Yeah, I, I, found, I, I, found, right. I found it a little dull. I will agree that Mary Lou is a fantastic horror movie villain. And like a lot of the practical 80s effects for the kills are really well done. I won't spoil it because I, I think people should check it out. But uh, you mentioned uh, a scene where she is sucked into a chalkboard. The way that they do that, that's a great very movie. creative, very well done. But I don't know, it was a little too slow paced for me. But I have some, like having seen like those movies back to back but out of order... I got some, like, it's an interesting contrast, and it'd be interesting to talk about Prom Night 3 in relation to Prom Night 2 in certain respects. Oh, yeah. But, you know, like, we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Yeah. yeah, we won't spoil anything, Corey, because, you know, check that out at some point. Yeah, it, you know, it's, I it's, think it's a I'm lot gonna. of fun. They're very different movies. I would say Prom Night 2 plays it a little more straight, whereas Prom Night 3 is very much like going in, like, the cheesy horror comedy. I watched venue. the trailer for the second one, and it looked like they were trying to go for a very serious tone, a horror movie that was trying to take itself seriously, and the third one was not that. Not at yeah. all. Well, what I, what I will add on to that is that, yes, Prom Night 2 takes itself a little more seriously, but it does have a little bit of a campy edge, and but because because it takes itself seriously, it's a lot more funny. Whereas Prom Night 3 is an out-and-out -out comedy, and let's just like pull this band-aid off, it's pretty lame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're discussing these two movies, but uh, you'll, you've probably noticed there's a, a noticeable uh, absence of uh, discussion about Prom Night 1. And that has to do with the fact that uh, this is a very weird series in that it's sort of a series within the series, in that Prom Night 1 has has nothing to do at all with the uh, character of Mary Lou. Uh, it's not about a supernatural prom queen who comes back. In fact, it is just a, a by-the-numbers basic slasher movie following in the footsteps of Halloween, right down to the fact that the main character is played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Really? Came out two years after Halloween, back really? when she was firmly in the uh, Scream Queen territory where she basically made nothing but horror movies up until about 1985 all with diminishing returns of halloween you know she's in mm -hmm. the fog she's in prom night she's in terror train uh road games you know and then eventually she's just like i gotta i gotta stop doing this uh, and then she does trading places and she gets her tits out and we all love her for it yeah we yeah, all appreciate yeah. it yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so prom night one honestly a, a very dull slasher the other uh, notable name in that is the principal is played by a, a pre-airplane leslie nielsen oh yeah so, no yeah so back before uh, he was known as uh, Mr. Comedy, this is just kind of the last gasp of, hey, remember me from, like, that one thing? Star-studded. Uh, I believe he is first billed, and, and if my memory doesn't betray me, he has about five lines. It's a, it's a very <laughs> odd huh. role. Yeah, Prom Night, uh, you, can, you can skip that. You can go right to Prom Night 2. And then Prom Night 2, they realized, I think, that they had something with Mary Lou there, and then they tried to carry it over to Prom Night 3, and then a few years later, Prom Night 4 comes out, and it just goes back to the killer escapes from a mental asylum and starts killing teenagers at prom. And it has nothing to do with Mary Lou, and they just sort of reset the franchise. And then in, like, mid-2000s, uh, there was a remake that also is about the uh, killer escapes from an insane asylum and uh, stalks people at a prom. The only notable thing about that is is that has a uh, uh, sort of mid-career role by uh, Idris Elba. No uh, fucking yeah, way. Right. After The Wire, but before everyone realized that uh, this guy's a goddamn movie star and he Whoa. was just laboring in a bunch of terrible horror movies. And this was one of them. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> he, I he was in Prom Night 4? 
No, he was in Prom Night, the remake. Oh! Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Which has uh, nothing to do with Mary Lou. Which has nothing to do with Mary Lou. So there, the are, there, there are five <laughs> movies, and only two of them are about Mary Lou, which is a big shame. And that should be the focus. Yes. Yeah. This movie's a bit of a whiff, and so I think that probably has to do something with the fact why Mary Lou kind of disappeared. But it is a shame that no one has attempted to reboot this and bring Mary Lou back, because as not great as this movie is, and this movie's okay. This movie's not terrible, but... I would love to see them take another crack at bringing Mary Lou back because I think there's some great untapped potential and there's not a lot of female slashers out there. I was just going to say, like, this is like another opportunity to have a very, like, scene-stealing female antagonist in in a horror film. And, like, what's not to love about a vampy, you know, all dolled up serial killer with a look of maniacal edge to her? Yeah, well, you know, the whole Freddy Krueger aspect, she's like this kind of undead girl. She's this sex-crazed, very possessive girlfriend who kills basically anybody who even mildly inconveniences her boyfriend. She's and a Freddy who fucks. Yeah. yeah. And in my in my fucked up mind, I'm like, we could be happy together. I think <laughs> yeah, I think we could yeah. I think we could build a life together. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I think well, I Well I mean that's what the guy does at one point like, let's set some ground rules. <laughs> hey, no more killing. You know, he's really entertaining the idea because goddamn Mary Lou's a bit of a hottie. <laughs> Willing to look the other way for a lot of things. He's like, listen, I you know, I'm I'm a kind of a I'm kind of a two murder maximum kind of guy. <laughs> Okay. If you start pushing that number a little higher, I don't know if I can go up to maybe mm. six or seven before I can start having to lay some ground rules. Yeah, and it's interesting because I know you didn't see Prom Night Two, but in Prom Night Two, she's really just out to recapture the glory of like she was never crowned as prom queen. She died. She like she got engulfed in flames before the crown was actually placed on her head. Yeah. So she's coming back to terrorize the school and her, her former boyfriends who are all like grown up now. But she's she's not boy crazy per se. She's like really in it for herself and she's going around the school possessing people and like killing people who are kind of getting in her way of that. Whereas in Prom Night 3, like, she's... She's all about that dick. She's taking... She's all about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that is her primary drive. Well, before we get into the plot of this, I want to break down the uh, directors of uh, Prom Night 3. Uh, This is the first movie we've ever covered that has two directors. None of my research has given me any more information about whether or not one of them started directing and then, you know, creative differences caused the other one to start doing, or if they both planned on directing the movie Mm. in tandem. Uh, But this movie is directed by Peter Simpson and Ron Oliver, who are the producer and writer Mm. of this movie. Peter Simpson, this is his only directing credit, but he produced all four Prom Night films, so these are kind of uh, his baby, sort of the, uh, the, uh, uh, Overseer. Wes Craven or the Sean Cunningham of the franchise. Keeper of the vision. But he's also uh, produced a variety of other schlocky horror and action films, including a movie we covered on this podcast, No Contest. Ah, excellent. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Which was very very good. That's Which one was, of the that's one yeah. of the better movies we've ever watched. Yes, on this indeed. Show. Yeah, yeah, it ranked really high on our ranking list. It, was, it like, did. Yeah. It was in the top three. I I, I, I believe think. so. Yeah. Corey, that's a that's a great uh, action movie. That's basically a Die Hard at a beauty pageant. No fucking way. Except John McClane is played by Shannon Tweed, <laughs> and Hans Gruber is played by Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> We, it's highly, hey, highly wait, 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 wait. It's, hold, it's hold on, hold on. Yeah, the guy who made jokes about fucking Mother Goose. That's the yeah, that's, yeah. That's, okay. that's Hans He's Gruber. playing a full-on '90s bad guy. He's played it <laughs> kind of straight. Mm-hmm. No one's really playing it straight in that movie. Mm-hmm. But the most surprising thing about that is that that actually turned out to be pretty damn good. <laughs> well, <laughs> it follows like the Die Hard formula, like practically to the letter. But goddamn, is it not like a, a pretty good Die Hard ripoff? <laughs> is there a moment that perfectly encapsulates I have? a machine gun now in that movie Ooh, what was the oh. line what was like the big line from I, I would have to go back and re-listen to the episode or watch the movie again and hey there's never a bad time to re-watch No Contest mm. uh, so uh, I'll get back to you in yeah. that. I, don't, I, I honestly don't remember <laughs> the only one I can think of is like Shannon Tweed at one point plays like the physical heavy who's played by Rowdy Roddy Piper and his character is wow. named Ice and uh, <laughs> she kills him and she goes looks like I iced Ice <laughs> <laughs> That's, so not quite no. Yubi Kaye. <laughs> Maybe it's, it doesn't follow Die Hard d- directly to the letter. But that yeah. is a, that is a movie ending line. You could have just hit the <laughs> end right there. <laughs> yeah, just like hard cut to credits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're back. Yeah, I was going to 
can't has get, gotten away by that point. We can't get better than not that. Not even a slow fade. Yes. Yeah. The other director, Ron Oliver, wrote the screenplay for Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. Prom Night 3 is his directorial debut. He then went on to direct multiple episodes of both Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps, which makes a lot of sense because this movie kind of feels like a dry run for those sort of oh, yeah. uh, those sort of episodes. I was going to say, other than like the sexual content, everything else is yeah. very Goosebumpy. Yeah, yeah, totally. Cut uh, out the gore, cut out the, the one scene of nudity. And well, I guess cut out the entire subplot where she just wants to fuck the guy over and yeah, over yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> edit this for TV, and it could be an episode of Goosebumps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you edit Prom Night Three for TV, then you wouldn't have much of a movie left. <laughs> it would be a solid twenty-two minutes. It would be for Goosebumps. It w- this could conceivably be a fucking Goosebumps episode. <laughs> yeah. He also directed multiple direct-to-DVD sequels, including Bigger, Fatter, Liar, oh. A Dennis the Menace Christmas, Granddaddy Daycare. And, of course, Beethoven 8, Beethoven's Treasure Tale. So he's really taken on the uh, the gold medals of all these films here. He's, he's, he's going... He's continuing the franchise. He's continuing all the franchises no one asked for sequels <laughs> to. I mean, this has to be like a get-rich-quick scheme that we have to cash in on. Find, like, some franchise that no one gives a shit about and, like, try to revamp it for the modern age. But he keeps doing it. Yeah. He's getting the money for it, so it's got to be lucrative. He's done. A, I mean, like that's we we talked about this. We did we did one of the uh, lesser Beethoven sequels uh, on a previous episode, and we were talking about how many of them are there, and also just how many direct to DVD sequels there are, and th- some of them are just mind blowing, and some of them have been going on for a while. There's there's like five Scorpion King movies. Mm. Uh, Wait, what? Yep. Yeah. They're all prequels because they had to cast like a younger guy who's younger than The Rock, and they're all like. <laughs> Before he was the Scorpion King, which is all like, well, I guess he's not the Scorpion King, then is he? <laughs> do, you, do you remember when The Mummy 2 first was coming out and the and the trailers were coming out and it was like The Rock and everyone was like, oh my god, he's the Scorpion King. And he was actually only in the movie for about 19 seconds. If you got to the theater late, you missed The Rock. Yeah. <laughs> he he and shows up later, but he's a CGI scorpion. <laughs> so <laughs> you would be confused into thinking, it's all like, is that all The Rock is doing in this? And... and to that point, he does not show up later. He is no, yeah, right. <laughs> not on set. He, he lends his likeness. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, that was a big, you know, like a uh, marketing deal for him because I'm pretty sure he shot that movie and The Scorpion King back to back because The Scorpion King came out yeah. the next year. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they were like put. They were they were like all in on this, mm-hmm. you know. And I re- I remember being genuinely excited about that too. And I wasn't even really a fan of wrestling at the time. I just remember The Rock being in a movie was the fucking coolest thing you could imagine. And now we're up to Scorpion King 6, Revenge of Tallahassee, or, or, or and it's some hard to, nonsense like that. And it's hard to imagine, like, The Rock not being in a movie. <laughs> in this That's day and age. true. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't he he, he... he did The Rock Bottom to somebody in... He definitely doesn't in Scorpion likely, King. Scorpion most likely, King. yeah. yeah. Th- yeah. Th- those first couple of movies, he he absolutely did The Rock Bottom in all of them. Even movies where it doesn't make sense for him to do The Rock Bottom. I'm pretty sure he does The Rock Bottom in Be Cool. I don't uh, <laughs> he doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't make sense in any movie that's not a wrestling movie. <laughs> Why in real life would you be like, you know, I gotta use a rock bottom right now. <laughs> so Ron Oliver has directed a couple of uh, directed DVD sequels, but he's mostly made his bread and butter writing and directing insane amounts of Hallmark movies, Christmas and otherwise, including, I just realized this morning... The movie that I'm in. Hey! So, this guy has written dialogue that I have been paid to say, which would be a conflict of interest if anyone listened to this podcast. (laughs) So, so you're like on a first name basis with this guy. Can you call him up as a guest? (laughs) This guy might have been on set while I was on set. I don't know. There was a lot of people there that day. He didn't direct it, so I didn't talk to him Uh, directly. But, uh, yeah, I was going through his credits. I'm all like, oh, shit. (laughs) He's too busy counting his Beethoven 8 money. (laughs) That's right. That, well, he... Beethoven found the treasure. So, you know, he's got, uh, to count, right. he's got to count those gold coins. Well, I just have a, a little bit more, because this guy's actually really fascinating. Uh, just a few more random Ron Oliver facts. He's friends and neighbors with cult film icon Udo Kier, who officiated his wedding to his husband. He was knighted in 2019 by the sovereign micronation of Sealand and is now referred to as Sir Ronald Robert Oliver OMS. And he looks like this. <laughs> 
Wow. This is a dapper fucking gentleman who I can say without a shadow of a doubt is certainly turtly enough for I the was turtle just say, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's royalty on a nation I've never heard of. Yeah. It's literally, I looked this up on Wikipedia. This is literally like a helicopter landing pad mm. in like the thing that someone has like, like lives a house on and did enough paperwork so that it is technically its own municipality. <laughs> I guess he visited it or something and like, yeah, now he's like in a, a knight of this. What do you imagine generation? a conversation with this man is like? I'd love to find out. And look, I have an in. Yeah. I, I've, I've been in a fucking movie. There so, like, he's a Canadian. He's working right now. So, if I ever get I hired bet, on another Hallmark movie. I bet you it's like very Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now. Like, there are all these, like, meandering conversations that don't really go anywhere. And yet, you can't turn away. <laughs> he's just like, the most fascinating person in the world. He must have, like, a scribe who, like, with royalty, someone will go, and now, Brendan. <laughs> Presenting Daenerys, uh, he's, he's first of his name, first of his name, director Produ of Beethoven, producer H. of Prom Night, <laughs> Sir Duchess the Vampire the Third, of uh, Lord Regent of Sea World, Sea Land, Sea Land. <laughs> We joke, we joke because we love Ron Oliver. Please, yeah. please call me. I'd love, I'd love to. I'd love to hang out with you and Udo Kier. That yeah. would be. That would make my day. All right. Do we want to get into the plot? Yeah. Yeah, we may as well. It's like fucking nearly forty minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's delay this episode a little bit further, and uh, let's let you listen to this week's charity shout out. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, the plot of Prom Night Three: The Last Kiss. So stay tuned. When this episode is released, the month of October will be winding down, and November will be right around the corner. And as the Canadian winter approaches, with all the hallmarks of longer nights, chillier temperatures, and gloomier weather, it's considered the most severe time for cases of seasonal affective disorders, which can greatly accelerate feelings of depression, isolation, and anxiety. And that's why for today's Charity Spotlight, I would like to acknowledge the annual Men's Health Charity Drive known as Movember. Yes, the ones where men pledge to raise money by growing mustaches for a month. Now, we all know that as far as charity drives go, Movember's most identifiable feature is a lighthearted call to action. But let's be clear that their motivations are no laughing matter. Too many men are dying young because they struggle silently with serious medical conditions or extreme cases of mental anguish. Around 10.8 men globally are facing life with a prostate cancer diagnosis. Globally, testicular cancer is the most common cancer among young men. And across the world, one man dies by suicide every minute of every day with males accounting for 75% of all suicides. Since 2003, Movember has funded more than 1,250 men's health projects around the world, changing the status quo, shaking up men's health research, and transforming the way health services reach and support men. Their aim is to increase early prostate and testicular cancer detection, provide diagnosis and effective treatments, and ultimately reduce the number of preventable deaths. Additionally, they are changing the way society and men in general handle mental health and suicide prevention by encouraging open communication and ease of access to professional support. The Movember organization aims to provide reliable, expert information to help men cope and live happier, healthier, and longer lives. If you would like to make a donation to the Movember Fund or start a drive of your own, visit ca.movember.com donate and navigate your way from there. The organization strives to be transparent and accountable with thorough reports on each project so that everyone can see how their support is changing the lives of brothers, fathers, husbands, sons, and friends all around the world. Again, the place to donate is ca.movember.com slash donate. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> That's my favorite part. So, like, kicking things off here, this is interesting. And, like, this is going to take a fucking long time to get through this whole plot. It's going to take a while to just talk about the first five minutes There's of this There's a lot movie. to unpack. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. so the movie opens with the shots of these shackled dancers in hell and Mary Lou escaping her binds in this, you know, depressing uh, hellscape. Now... For me, someone who was unfamiliar with this movie, where Mary Lou even was, what this, what I was even looking at, this just looked like a basement suite I used to live in. Yeah, so I was <laughs> I lived in apartments that looked like this. Yeah, <laughs> my favorite, absolute favorite detail is that this is hell, and she escapes hell with a nailing file. 
Yeah, <laughs> just that simple. You, you gotta admire how economical Mary Lou is. I mean, like <laughs> Freddy Krueger, you know, like he, he has to be b- brought back to life with a ritual. Like yeah. Jason has to be struck by lightning. Mary Lou literally just files through her chains yeah. and then she's back on Earth. No questions asked. Satan's like, God, Drax. <laughs> <laughs> Not another one. <laughs> so the reason I, I found this so fascinating is because like it's a weird visual right off the bat. I was totally lost right from the get go, and the only thing that kept me from like the really rolling my eyes was okay, this is probably like ex- this is a direct continuation from where the second movie ends. Not and so much. And I was like, I'm sure this is all set up and explained very well by the end of Prom Night Two. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, one might assume that the people making this would want to carry over some continuity because it's literally the same people who made Prom Night 2 mm. who are making Prom Night 3. It's not the same director, but mm. like it's them shepherding this franchise. But no, it, it really doesn't mention the events of Prom Night 2 at all. Mm. They're like, how did Prom Night 2 end again? I don't know. I just kind of glanced over it. Let's make the third one already. It does yeah. not end with her being imprisoned <laughs> back in hell. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. To the point, I mean, like, it doesn't reference anything from Prom Night 2 right up to the point that unfortunately Mary Lou is not played by the same actor from Prom Night 2 I was gonna ask Lisa Schradge plays her in uh, Prom Night 2 Uh, Jameson you will remember her as the lady who hires the Shadow Warriors and uh, saw from uh, we're referencing a lot of old episodes I know right it's like a clip show uh, it's it's like the um, Rosetta Stone of our (laughs) podcast here Uh, but she's played in this movie by an actress named Courtney Taylor uh, who didn't really go on to do anything else uh, didn't after see... this. Oh, she was in the, w- one of her few acting credits. I will bring this up because this is, yet again, something else I've mentioned on the podcast before. Uh, she's in this movie called The Dragon Gate, which I've mentioned on the podcast before, Jameson, when we were talking about uh, one of our favorite directors, Mike Marvin. One of my favorite directors. I don't know if you, if you like him. Uh, but th- this is the uh, movie that uh, has the uh, DVD cover that proudly proclaims that it is banned in Korea. So she's the female lead of that. Look at it. It's bigger than the title on... The... Why is it banned I, in Korea? I thought no movie... one knows. We'll have to find out. I thought the movie is called Banned, banned in Korea. Banned in Korea. Yeah. So uh, Mary Lou is, is back on the scene. She's uh, she's back to haunt the school. Right as like they're, they're just unveiling the new gymnasium. They're proudly announcing that uh, all those like ghost stories that happened here at this school because the one through line from the original movie is that this is the exact same high school. They're in a sense of like we're not afraid of ghosts anymore. Uh, we're gonna like open the doors to our new gymnasium. We're gonna have a prom and everything. But like, it's everyone seems to be well aware that this terrible accident has happened at this school. There were lots of killings. There was like a there were some ghost shenanigans that went down. But everything's all cool now. And the principal tactfully handled that by going up in front of the whole school and reminding everybody <laughs> all of the horrible events yeah. that happened. With all the conviction of a guy who doesn't even <laughs> believe it himself. <laughs> think it happened it definitely did but i don't know <laughs> and just put all of that bloodshed out of your mind and then he immediately proceeds to slice his finger off with the <laughs> right. uh, ribbon cutting ceremony <laughs> things in a shot that lovingly lingers on that fake ass finger uh, for a lot longer than it probably should doors fly open like supernatural wind comes spill out and yeah. everyone's just like just remain seated everybody it, be calm it is, it's, we, it's it, all fine it is a little weird how the doors fly open it, it does sort of like lead one to to think that mary lou had some to do with the principal cutting his finger off. I don't think so. I think he was just a fucking klutz. And I, I think he just. I was yeah. gonna say she yeah. comes in. That wind comes in, and she's laughing. She's laughing because he's an idiot who, who who cuts shit like that with your finger sticking out. That whole scene reminded me of uh, many years ago. I was working at Electronic Arts in the the QA department, and uh, the fire bell goes off one day, and so like we're all like like we all get out of our desks and like we all like, head towards the exit, and the uh, one of the floor managers came by and said like, okay, everyone, just like go back to your seats. We're making. We're not expecting a fire drill today we're gonna get to the bottom of this and we're all thinking if we're not expected to have a fire drill today then this is a real goddamn fire we should get the fuck out of here (laughs) nobody panic this is not a real fire but everyone please exit the building slightly faster than we practiced Uh, I should have mentioned uh, earlier, the, the reason that Prom Night 2 and Prom Night 3 have no connection to Prom Night 1 is that uh, Ron Oliver originally did not write them as Prom Night sequels. They were original horror movies that he wrote himself called The Haunting of Hamilton High and The Haunting of Hamilton High 2 mm. that he wrote at the same time and he shopped them around uh, trying to get them sold on the uh, basis that uh, he could make one immediately after the other. And uh, Peter Simpson, I'm assuming, saw that and said like, Great, can we just 
happen? Can, can we just throw Prom Night on there? And he's all like, well, Prom Night was about a, a serial killer who was stalking <laughs> uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. It, it, was, it wasn't about, like, a supernatural entity. It's all like that. It's fine. It's fine. We'll just, you know, we'll call it Prom Night, too. And and that's how the uh, the weird legacy uh, mm, comes about. I, started. I don't remember if the, the school in Prom Night 1 is called Hamilton High. I'm going to guess it wasn't. It is, of course, uh, it is called Hamilton High because uh, these are thoroughly Canadian movies and they oh, were yeah. shot in Ontario. And, yeah. and uh, you, you, can, you can tell. You can definitely tell by the... Uh, <laughs> How cheap it looks. Yeah. <laughs> Let's call it that, sure. All right, so at this point, we are introduced to our main protagonist, Alex, who uh, whose main gripe <laughs> is that he is just perfectly average across the board. He is average height, he is average intelligence, I imagine average weight, and he is torn between, like, his need for something more, whether or not he wants to spend the summer with his girlfriend or the summer with his best friend. Who is clearly in love with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, him really? and his best friend were a lot closer than him and his girlfriend. Can we... Yeah. Like, that... That that sit up scene that was yeah. that was that was, that was intimate. intimate that was an intimate scene yeah yeah and that's that, the introduction of that character so you you would be forgiven for for assuming this, this is this this is the first time we've seen these characters so like I know my first time watching this was just all like what's going on here all right <laughs> they're, they're doing like sit ups up towards each other like right up on, to their faces right up like they're on the same rowing machine. Yeah, <laughs> and then Sh Shane, the best friend, has that one dangly earring that I guess was was that fashionable was, in okay, the '80s, well, but nowadays is is yeah. pretty coded in the '80s and like early '90s though. That was definitely the thing. Oh yeah, it, it kind of fits him, I guess, in Ooh. that regard. That's he wears a lot of like cut off shirts as well too. I don't know. I got my thoughts about Shane. Yeah. He, he's a clingy yeah. friend. Yeah. He's yeah. very clingy. at the very most, he's like super catty towards Sarah. <laughs> She's trying to take his best take, take his best, <laughs> yeah, best, best friend. friend. Yeah, yeah. So the joke about Alex is that he's thoroughly average, and uh, boy, did they cast this role correctly. Yep. Because, uh, <laughs> this this actor, his name is Tim Conlon, and he just boy, he just gives one. Hell, average of performance. Well, wow. Average fucking performance. And it, it, it's just like, I get that that's the joke of this character, but the situations that he continuously finds himself in require you to sort of, you know, overact a little bit. You need to react to what's happening. Every time he finds a dead body, he's just kind of like, oh, oh God. Great. Oh, great. Oh, come yeah, on. Mary Lou. It's with this again. <laughs> it's the same enthusiasm like when the pizza guy forgets the breadsticks. You're like, oh, no, man. <laughs> Damn it. Whatever. Fine. <laughs> this actor, uh, he he really liked appearing in sequels to stuff. Uh, he also appeared in Revenge of the Nerds three, Starship Troopers two, and he even managed to sneak into Ocean's thirteen, which is like a, oh. an actual big movie with movie stars. So I don't I don't know how he managed that. Yeah. So Alex has like this meeting with the the guidance counselor who seems to have a weird grudge against him. <laughs> he, she, he he wants to be he, he wants to go to medical school. She says like his his grades aren't good enough, and to maybe like aim lower, like be of like a burger flipper or something. Thing. And not like you know, like take take some first aid course, maybe be a paramedic or something. Can you know? we can we talk about how much of a hard on she has for making sure students are like puts them down like fucking <laughs> hardcore? She like sucks. you can't do what you want. Well, You're she's going... a broad comedic character. Yeah, you know? she's she's not meant to be to, to the point where no one treats her as like an actual human being. Actually, kind of one of the movie's best jokes. Where jumping ahead a bit, she she obviously is one of the victims of, of Mary Lou, and when they find the mass grave later on, they, they you know they list all the people buried in the thing, and then someone throws in kind of loud like, oh yeah, there was a guidance counselor, her face all burned up or some shit and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you stop killing people. Alex, it wasn't a person. It was a guidance counselor. Yeah, yeah, no, she's no, like, no one treats her as human like, being. You come up, to, she's a living person, Mary Lou. She wasn't a person. She's a guidance counselor. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what really bothered me about that scene, I don't know whose choice this was, but they put like this this plant, this cactus, this right cactus in the middle, of the, right in the middle, blocking his face, blocking his fucking face, like half of it, and then her too. And there was a couple of events, it's like the, the scene where yeah. like when his family's like saying, "Hey, congratulations!" Yeah, yeah. The cast and, and the there's like streamers hanging down that are like perfectly blocking their face. <laughs> Two directors, and no, neither, of them no, neither of them noticed this. <laughs> That's a really good point. So he wants to uh, improve his grades, so he decides he's going to like stay after hours at the school and, and study a little bit more. This is where like he uh, he he runs afoul of Mary Lou, uh, you know, like, startles him, scares him right up until like she gets a good look at his face and she is like, like Ooh. Oh, oh a, a less attractive David Schwimmer, you said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's been a while for Sign Mary Lou. Let's up. <laughs> yeah. 
This is the best and, uh, choice. And Alex fucking cheats on his girlfriend right then and there. They fuck on an American flag. Uh, he he wakes um, up. He wakes up the next day. It, it's it's already daytime and everyone's at school. Uh, he gets up. He's completely naked. We see uh, a half second of ball sack. I don't know if you have the other of you. You know what? That. I I clocked that in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I clocked it in. <laughs> <laughs> I saved that for later. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so now like he's like fully aware and like fully in like you know, the, the the crosshairs of Mary Lou. Well, he takes it, it takes him a while for him to, to figure out what's going on. Mm. Predictably, he, he does the annoying horror movie trope where he's all like, "This couldn't possibly be happening, right?" Until he very quickly comes to the realization, "Oh, I guess I'm fucking a ghost now," and then he's totally fine with it and doesn't mind at all. He comes to terms with it really quickly. He comes to terms with everything. <laughs> with a lot quickly. of things. Really quickly. Yeah. Well, like okay, so just to back up like a second that scene where he wakes up on the american flag mm -hmm. wait why did it, it's a canadian movie it's not set in canada canadian movie you you know yeah, this, yeah, canadian yeah. movies yeah. are rarely set in canada i don't know why i, even, I don't know why I even asked. anyway <laughs> he calls his parents like that morning and does then, he it sounds like he calls the muppets <laughs> Charlie Brown's parents, yeah. and he, I just don't, like, I feel like a lot of serious situations that would be serious today mm. were not taken super seriously in this movie. Like, it's almost like this movie is fucking wacky. Yeah, your child, you're, like, your child just doesn't come home, right? Mm. What would, what would happen? You would call the police, there would be, there would be a search, there would be a, a ton of shit going on. Right. The school, like, the school like probably would have been contacted and they weren't like oh you were missing last night your parents called us but no yeah they were like oh. Shane probably covered for him you know well, he's, Shane's you know, he's, a good guy he's a good guy he's, he's, a, yeah. good he's a good friend a little too good of a friend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know actually come to think of it when the bodies start piling up nobody really notices that like teachers have gone missing That's no one realizes the janitor has gone missing the only reason they discover the bodies is because they have to reseed the football field <laughs> <laughs> and like, they find the mass grave that's why they haven't been showing up to work <laughs> well my my theory is that death is death and, and, and maimings are, are just like a regular everyday occurrence at Hamilton High even before Mary Lou shows up because we we hear a, a constant airplane-esque wacky uh, PA yeah. announcements including one about the today's driver's ed class has been cancelled and the services for uh, the Mr. Jones uh, will be taking place on Tuesday so the the, the driver's ed instructor uh, you know died in a horrible car crash and Mary Lou didn't even have anything to do with that shit my, my favorite the PA announcements were great my favorite one was uh, today in inter school Chess club tournament has been canceled. Club members are asked to report to the library and play with themselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when these people are dying, Mary Lou's like, okay, you have to hide their bodies now. It's like, why? Are people going to link the ice cream stab science teacher to me somehow? Like, why do I have to hide this? It's making it worse if I have to stay in this room. It's really sweaty. And hide and, this yeah, body. Yeah, yeah it, it's weird. It just, make, it, it just incriminates him further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's weird because, like, Mary Lou wants to, she wants to help out her, her new boyfriend. She, she, like, manipulates, like, the test score so he passes. She's on the football field and she's, like, you know, possessing other players so that he actually makes the, the winning catch or whatever. She wants to improve his life and yet she immediately inconveniences him by saying now someone's gonna have to get rid of these bodies and it's not gonna be me you're a supernatural demon just disappear them what are you talking why are you something. getting him to you're putting him in more danger mm. fire like anything yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no but no he's the one that has to bury them uh, in the middle of the field so you, you talked about this um this biology teacher Let's, <laughs> this, 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 this fucking is, goomba this fucking guy <laughs> so this this is sort of like mary lou's first kill sort of like for, uh, mary lou's first freddy moment where uh, she sort of uh, hoists a character by their own petard this, this character, uh, Mr. Walker, uh, who's one defining trait, uh, is uh, he's a big fatty and he loves chocolate and he loves sugar and hey, he's he, constantly eating uh, throughout the scene. He like, loves telling the students that they're not going to amount to anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, As like teachers all, do. Seems like all the teachers have hey, that. Fuck off, you little bastards. Good <laughs> yeah. luck at this test. Yeah. yeah. It's not like it's going to matter. You're all going to fail. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, he's grading tests. Mary Lou uh, made Alex uh, fall asleep, uh, so he, he wrote nothing on his test, so he writes an F on the page, and then uh, Mary Lou magically uh, an answers uh, the, the test in, uh, I, I guess she just is perfectly knowledgeable about whatever subject that is, mm -hmm. uh, and gives, gives herself an A+, plus, and then transforms into a 1950s soda jerk? Yeah, like a diner waitress or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And much like Alex, this teacher has no reaction to this. <laughs> uh, just, <laughs> He just kind of like. Hey, Toots, you're in a lot of trouble you're for pulling this shit. You're in a lot of trouble here. This, yeah. this is this prank has gone far enough. Mm -hmm. You brought this ice it's cream like, machine, bro. An entire fucking like soda fountain has <laughs> materialized in your classroom They're... out of nowhere. Mm. You might want to be a little. You might want to have like a few more follow up questions. There aren't <laughs> enough questions being asked, and not just by him. By mm. probably many a of you, questions guys. should be asked. For God's yes. sakes, he's the science teacher. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna wonder about this yeah. kind of crap. <laughs> so she stabs into both of his hands with ice cream cones, and she turns them into a big banana split. Oh, uh, it was so upsetting because like the blender like is gonna go through like the the. Four Yes, that happens too, And then yeah. the camera cuts right before you see it come out the other end. Oh, it was so disappointing. That could have been a nice little gory Yeah, it just kind of bulges. Yeah. 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 So it must not have looked really good. <laughs> so I do want to say that this actor is George Trivalo, who is Canada's greatest heavyweight boxer. Oh. What? Who fought Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and George Foreman. Holy shit. And what? The, the reason I know this is because when I was a teenager, George Trivalo came to my high school and gave a speech in the gymnasium Part of which was talking about his cameos in movies, which which included him showing scenes from this movie and also uh, his role in uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly, where I believe uh, Jeff Goldblum breaks his arm in, in a bar fight. Oh, sick. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. Which is something that I remembered as I was watching this whole, like, I've totally met this guy. That's awesome. <laughs> so a little bit of weird random trivia. There. Universal. Yeah. <laughs> that guy uh, punched him, Muhammad Ali in the face. Uh, he did not win. Uh, but uh, I did uh, read, according to Wikipedia, in uh, over uh, 93 professional fights, he was never knocked off his feet once. Wow. So there you go, sir. You're, Damn, a, you're a Canadian him. icon. And then he was felled by two ice cream cones. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what they that's what they tried. Well, that's what happens when you can't beat Muhammad Ali. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been Muhammad Ali in that role. He was never knocked off his feet, but what got him in the end? Diabetes. <laughs> so, yeah, Alex is, like, you know, burying the, 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 the dead bodies in, in the football field, and that's scene is like intercut with like a sex scene between him and, uh, and Mary Lou which is a weird fucking boner yeah so <laughs> Is, did, does he stop burying him to go have sex and then come back to burying? Because it, it is just... an intercut. Yeah. yeah. I guess, it's I guess, it's he, weird. Yeah. I think he buries them really quickly, and then he goes to have sex with her. Uh, but I think, like, as he's burying her, he's, he's sort of... Fantasizing. Uh, he's imagining the sex that he's about to have. Yeah. It's, it's, the, only time, it's the only time the movie yeah, gets a little artistic. <laughs> gets, a little, <laughs> gets a little Terrence Malicky, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like... You guys can't see the forth. air quotes yeah. right now. And that's when... <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he like he starts laying the ground rules for Mary Lou. He's like, okay, well, we got to lay some ground rules if we're going to keep doing this. No more killing. Uh, don't hurt my friends. That kind of shit, right? Stop calling my, my family. <laughs> yeah. You've crossed some boundaries, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> well, she does. She, 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 the it, sex it, must be really good. <laughs> it must be out of this world. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a d demon succubus from hell. I, I, gotta, I mean, that's the whole... That's their whole deal. Yeah. yeah. You know, is, is amazing sex, but you, you, you lose your immortal soul. But, yeah, you know, yeah. it's all like... There's compromise. But, you know... Well, you know, it's, it's funny, because, like, like, you would imagine, like, like she, her influence is corrupting him. Not entirely. Like, he's getting, like, some success. He's getting more popularity because of his football wins. But his personality really doesn't change until his parents reward him with a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, and then it switches on a dime, and he's rude to his little sister, and mm -hmm. he... I mean, well, like, we, we can see him slowly starting to change over the course of things. He starts starts alienating Shane, which broke my heart. Uh, but he's always kind of been a dick to his girlfriend, Sarah, yes. anyway. Dick to his Sarah girlfriend. Who's like, the, who seems really nice. Yeah. She seems so And sweet. too good for Alex. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the role that I want to mention about uh, Sarah, played by uh, Cynth Cynthia Preston, she's been in a lot of things, but the one thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention is that she's the voice of Princess Zelda in the 89 Zelda cartoon. Oh, fucking Oh. Yeah. So, Crazy. Uh, so every time that she uh, complains about something in this movie, you are perfectly justified to say... Excuse me, 
princess. <laughs> but she doesn't complain about it. Like she like specifically I says mean, she's justified in, in, oh, in her complaints. Of course, but like she, as she says multiple times when they're having a fight, she's like, "We're not fighting," and, and I'm not mad. I don't get mad. I bake. Yeah. And I'm just like, God damn! If if I had a girlfriend who baked every time, like she, like she was mad at me or uh, mad at something I did, I'd be the fattest man in the world. But like when she <laughs> bakes, she bakes, and she like ba- this is a running joke because we see her again, and she's seeming with anger, but she's also pulling insane amounts of trays of like cookies. Like seven sheets of cookies. Yeah, she's made like 80 of them or mm. something. She's just like filled up her kitchen with, with baked goods. And uh, it, that that does lead to, as you mentioned, Corey, uh, sort of the uh, yippee kaye moment at the uh, end. Can we save uh, that? Uh, let, like, yes, let, let's, let's save that. We'll save it for the end. All, all I will say is that <laughs> pretty big disappointment. Yeah, uh, yeah. The payoff is uh, not what I was hoping it would be. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I uh, We'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we will. <laughs> okay, so fuck. Alex's dad uh, has like a heart to heart with him just as he's about to, uh, to head up because he's like, uh, we tried inviting uh, Sarah over to dinner, but she's, it sounds like things are on the rocks between you guys. So I'm um, like, let me guess. It's another woman. And this is like, okay, dad's going to have like a nice like, you know, father-son chat with him. And he's like, you know, be careful with like those those other women out there. And uh, I've had opportunities, like, but I never acted on them. But I got to tell you, those, those fucking heartbreakers. Like, it sounds like maybe... He did kind of go over the line a he's little bit. He's also furiously cleaning and then assembling his rifle as yeah. he's doing it, with, yeah. which is both a phallic and a very funny visual gag. A lot and of he, unchecked anger with this guy. It, it, you can chalk it up to plot points that were introduced and not really touched on again. <laughs> Dad's past romances and the anger that ensued. I think they just realized that this was a funny actor and they just all like, let's write a scene for him because, you know, mm. like we, we can do some stuff with this. I mean, that dad has, like, three scenes, right? Mm. So this, this was maybe his biggest scene. So the yeah. director really sat down and was like, okay, we're going to chop this down into chunks and I want you to feel all these different emotions. I want you to... He like It looks like he did a bunch of actor's work. It's like, who are you thinking of when you're saying this? <laughs> yeah. Since we're talking about the dad, I just want to talk about a, a, a joke that just didn't work for me. When he gets the 100% on his history paper, Mary Lou calls the house, uses the teacher's voice to say that he got 100%, and they've thrown a big party for him, and, and they're making all of his favorites, including his dad's world-famous banana splits, which is meant to be ironic, seeing as his teacher was turned into a banana split, but, like, there have never been world-famous banana splits ever. It is... Anyone can fucking make a banana split. It is the <laughs> easiest fucking thing to make in the world. It's They are totally humoring that dad. Mm. It's all, like, he can't make fucking anything, and he feels bad about mm. it, and, and, and he put fucking ice cream in a bowl and put banana, and it's all like, Honey! These are amazing! And he just, he never shuts up about it ever yeah. since. That's like people who brag about being the best at making craft dinner. They're like, you never <laughs> tasted my craft dinner. I would argue, harder to make than a banana split. Uh, yeah. I, I have to imagine that, like, he knows it's, like, kind of run-of-the-mill, but, like, he's the dad, so everything's gotta be, like, well, here's my world-famous banana split, you guys. Like, oh, yeah. dad. Oh, dad. <laughs> it's like, whenever I'm at my dad's place, really, dad, park. is it? Oh, sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, well, always, like, we'll have, like, dinner, and, like, he, he won't have napkins, but we'll have, like, paper towel, and he calls out the fancy napkins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really, dad, are they world-famous? Uh. World <laughs> did, 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 did Morocco call recently? Yeah. <laughs> like, get, you get that, like, fucking, like, shipped over in wholesale. Sale. Yeah, it was you and Gordon Ramsay, neck and neck. <laughs> I'm surprised that father was available for the film with all the banana splits he was making worldwide. <laughs> That's his <job. laughs> like, Well, you know me, I, I, 11 months on, one month off. Yeah. This, is a, this is a month where I get to come home and be with my family. It was right? a high, it was Just, a Finally away from all That's the banana splits. He had all those opportunities to cheat on his wife. <laughs> <laughs> when he was away for 11 months, just be a confectionary guru. <laughs> it was a hard day down at the those split high, factory. Those high stakes ice God. cream worlds. <laughs> Christ. Let's so, get back to the plot so we can so stay on this for yeah. a while. So Alex uh, goes to the football field to bury another victim, and uh, he's accosted by the school bully, Andrew, which... Okay, so we, we got we to gotta dial back a little bit, because mm. he buries the guidance counselor. Yeah. And I take umbrage with this entire scene. So this is really like Mary Lou immediately phoning it in. Like this this is like kill number two. Mm. And she's already lost any sense of creativity. Mm. Now, the weird thing about this guidance counselor is that 
they keep uh, focusing on her nail file, right? Like, like yeah. in the opening scene, she's, like, doing her nails, and the camera even, like, zooms in at one point of her, like, doing her nails. And, like, years of watching horror movies instantly tell you that's going to be how she's going to get her, yeah. her comeuppance. But what does Mary Lou do? But first of all, you know, like, like when Freddy Krueger, like, tricks someone into, like, an ironic comeuppance, like, he'll usually trick them into something, you know? Yeah. Someone likes uh, late-night TV, so he'll cool. turn into a TV set or, or something like that. He'll seduce them, uh, pretending to be a woman or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. Mary Lou corners her in the middle of a busy school hallway, gr limply grabs her arm, drags her to another location, and then is all like, oh, these nails. She even says, oh, your nails are atrocious. Let me sit you in this beauty chair. And it's all like, here we go. Something to do with nails, something to do with nails. <laughs> yeah. What does she do? How does she kill the guidance counselor? Well, the only reasonable next step would be to pour battery acid on her face. <laughs> battery acid. idea obviously setting up something that you know is going to be the joke and then doing completely like dropping an anvil on someone yeah but it being battery acid is just specific enough for it to be confusing and Ooh. not funny oh. so, so anyway so yeah he's got to bury that body uh the school bully who's like you know he's pissed off that he's you know, not getting recognized on the football field anymore confronts alex at the field and says like what are you doing here and it's like, like what the fuck are you doing here andrew it's like the middle of the goddamn night yeah, yeah it's like 3 a.m like yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are these kids doing Just, what what was he doing wandering around like on the football yeah fully clothed in his letterman jacket <laughs> for my 3 a.m yeah. stroll yeah and, nerd. So, and so he he uh he threatens alex but mary lou shows up as a like disguise or not disguise she's wearing football gear tosses a football at him it mid-air transformations this, this into way, a drill this, this fucking idiot. Wait, wait. yeah yeah go ahead okay yeah. so before that throw he she shows up in the fog dressed as a football player and he turns and his, his instinct is like who's that oh it's my friend like yeah is that, you, is that you, Smitty? Is that you, Smitty? Is that you? Yeah, okay. You want me to go long? I, I was about to kick this guy's ass, but yeah, let's toss the old pigskin around. 3 a.m. pigskin toss? Let's do it. <laughs> is very easily distracted because there's like a scene earlier on when they're in the locker room after Alex has, has won a game and uh, Andrew's about to punch him in the face but then Mary Lou comes on the PA and says like if Andrew go to the principal's office he's all like you're lucky this time and it's like nothing was preventing you from still punching him in the face yeah. it's like no you could you could still do it and he's all like you're lucky you're lucky that fucking <laughs> voice came on otherwise yo, you'd be in trouble oh the principal must really need me like <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go right away well, I think I think the announcement said like your mom brought your lunch to school or something. Right, like, yeah. You know? So he must Can't keep, he's hungry. Yeah. yeah. Can't keep my mom waiting. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. <laughs> so at that point, uh, Alex is at his last straw. He breaks he breaks things off with uh, with Mary Lou. Uh, that's when she has her neon pink hissy <laughs> fit at him. Um and, <laughs> which I guess was a thing. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but the next day they're watching like a film in sex ed with a teacher who by all rights should probably be fired. Get <laughs> that lady away from the underage boys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, we'll touch on that for a second. <laughs> she, she straight up just sexually harasses, like, two of those kids just in like class. Just, like, gently, like, touches, like, a kid's face. It's just all like, that'll get you fired. Yep. That'll get yeah. you fired immediately. Sitting on her desk, like, just, like, a hair away from doing, like, the Sharon Stone thing in Basic Instinct. <laughs> I thought she was. I thought the legs were going to cross. Yeah. And they're watching, like, a sex ed film, but uh, Mary Lou is in the sex ed film, and uh, she says, like, I'm not going to give up on you, and uh, your whole fucking, like, if I can't have you, no one can have you. So she starts targeting Sarah and Shane. I, I, I touched on this earlier, but, like, I, I really, and I, I don't mean to harp on one particular actor, but, like, I really have to state again that just, like, the, the switch in Mary Lou's is just so deep disappointing like Courtney Taylor is just not nearly as, as fun as as the first Mary Lou she, I had a lot of fun watching her but uh, yeah but for for different reasons oh sure yeah right. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong sure. like yeah very 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 lovely to look mm -hmm. upon but like but you're the vapid. Yeah. you're the killer yeah you're Freddy like like even when she kills Andrew with that football like like or she goes like touchdown and you know like you you could someone someone you know yeah. like uh, you know, put a little shine on that or and, yeah. and, but 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 She's just, she's just very limply just kind of yeah. like, touchdown. Touchdown! Oh, no. Not again. 
Mariloo, look, I know you're doing what you think is best here, but Lisa, I can't keep up with you anymore. What's the other actress? Lisa Schrage? Lisa Schrage. Yeah, uh, she she had, like, that twinkle of, like, mania in her eye in all of her scenes, even, like, before uh, Mary Lou died. So she yeah, she would embody that character a little bit better. So, I think. Yeah, I think yeah it, it is a shame that she didn't return for this movie. Yeah. yeah. And who knows why? Who knows? Because she didn't... Uh, she, wasn't, she wasn't busy with anything else. Maybe she <laughs> was. <laughs> what was she doing? I don't know. You, you, you recap the plot. I'm going to look that up. Okay, so the cops are, like, investigating the, uh, the, like, the missing bodies uh, and everything. Sarah starts going out with Leonard, the, I guess the school nerd who... My favorite character. Yeah, who, like, really could, like, just, like, take off the glasses, fix up his hair, and he would not be the nerd. He was a good-looking He's cat. built yeah. like a fucking brick shithouse, which yeah. is funny, because there's, like, an entire pointless scene where Andrew's all like, Leonard, you're off the team, is all like, he's huge! Yeah. He's a huge guy! <laughs> he was he was above average of the average main character. Yeah. And he was supposed to be a below-average guy. So, yeah, like, he, like, he... He's now starting to court Sarah. He's like breaking down like their date night, like a fucking like itinerary. Like a, at uh, seven o'clock, I meet your parents. We have uh, pleasantries until seven ten. At seven fifteen, we uh, we'll leave unless there's uh, time for pictures, in which case we will leave at seven twenty. Uh, okay. If this were the kind of movie where you didn't know who the killer was and you were trying to guess, my money would have been on Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when this movie was uh, in production, uh, Lisa Schrage was uh, starring in Food of the Gods Part Two. So uh, <laughs> that makes perfect what? sense. And, uh, 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 you know, obviously. Obviously, she could not return. She yeah. was busy fighting off giant rats. Yeah. Bobby, I want you to meet my colleague, Dr. Hamilton. And I'll like you to get the fuck out of here. No, it's all get out of here. Get out of my room. Get out of here, bitch. Get out of here. At what point Shane does die? Right after Alex uh, confides to him, like, everything that's going on, that he is sleeping with a ghost and she's the one responsible for the killings and which he buys immediately he again very good friend like he's just like wow man that's tough like, geez, like he's man. relating like yeah that happened to me a while back too you know? <laughs> women am I right <laughs> women <laughs> And yeah, he like you know he he sort of like you know puts Alex up for a little bit, and then there's a knock at the door, and it's Alex's sister Leah, who is actually Mary Lou, you know, in in the disguise as her. But I gotta think like he would not want to go after his uh, his best friend's little sister, also, who he's how, known for a while. How young also, is this probably sister young. supposed to be? That she yeah. seemed uncomfortably young to be. <laughs> Very as, much so. I mean, I know she's she's Mary Lou pretending to be mm -hmm. a thing, but it's like also, did you notice like this scene was like weirdly eighty yard? I noticed that uh, she yeah. was weirdly wearing a. a a lot, <laughs> a lot of the movie actually really does feel that way. Like, yeah, not yeah. just that like, scene, but like, I know you're talking. I noticed in this scene in particular, the, the characters were talking and their lips were not moving. That not not their lips weren't matching the words that were coming out. Their lips were not moving. I Ooh. think that particular actress. I don't think that was her voice the whole movie. I, even in the ah, other scenes, mm. even in the other scenes, even in the other scenes, like there's still like not full mouth to word match up there. Yeah, I believe so it. So I think there's a, a deep conspiracy here. <laughs> maybe she was French Canadian and they just dubbed her with a, a proper Anglophone. Or, or maybe they're like, well, she's gonna be like some sort of sexual icon character later in the movie, and like maybe the actress just had a very like young sounding voice mm. to, to go along with her yeah. young looking face <laughs> <laughs> and young proportional body. <laughs> Let's get off this topic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she kills Shane. And at this point, the police are like following up on the leads and Alex is their number one suspect. So Alex goes back to his home because he's thinking like his family's going to be next. He uh, gets his dad's gun uh, under which a... Is, which will work great on a fucking ghost. <laughs> you dumbass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't really know what his fucking plan is there. Police uh, apprehend him, and they, they throw him into the slammer. This is the one sort of Mary Lou gag that I actually kind of like, where she's the news reporter on TV, and Shane's corpse is there. That's kind of like the one time that she's kind of all like, in recent news, uh, Alex will marry Mary Lou. Isn't that right, Shane? Is this called? See, you're kind of, you're having fun here. Yeah. You're, yeah. Having fun. you're having some fun that I wish you would carry over into the rest of this. Yeah. One thing I didn't appreciate about that uh, news scene is that uh, Shane's corpse has like a massive green screen hole. <laughs> in him from like when she like punched his heart uh, out of his chest like just make it another like gory looking practical effect don't slap a green e sticker on e him either so that or have Shane be the weatherman yeah and then it's already a blue screen anyway so you can just see like a storm cloud in between the hole in his chest yeah yeah <laughs> So the prom goes forward, even though there's been, like, a killing spree at the school. <laughs> yeah, the principal is so fucking gung-ho. He's like, hey, guy, like, 
I don't know why, like, what town has, like, a news conference over this, but they're like, hey, guys, listen, I know you all want prom night to happen, I know we've got weird fucking murders happening everywhere, but don't you worry, prom night's gonna go off tonight without a hitch. Sorry, Corey, you don't know what town would have a news conference where they found three bodies buried in a football field? What, sorry, but the, the, sorry, I'm, what I mean is, to the, is the yeah. focus of the conference is on, is prom night still gonna happen, or <laughs> are we just gonna not do this anymore? <laughs> We're just prom crazy over here. <laughs> like, the, the, the whole bodies being discovered is just an afterthought. They're like, well, that, that sucks, but like, uh, what about prom? I mean, uh, is prom going to happen? Jesus Christ, at this point, they're like, 0 for 2 for proms in this town. <laughs> <laughs> 0 for 3. I actually did look it up. Uh, ha- ha- Hamilton High is one of the things that carries over to all uh, of the uh, the movies. So, uh, yeah, oh. I guess he must have. That's, that's what I mean. That's like, a tangent. They haven't had their third prom yet. They had their that's one. Right. Yeah, they, they had, had their one. one. They had their second. It didn't go great. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I like how it's been escalating from like fucking slasher serial killer supernatural entity. Like, what's the next thing it have? Like a like a goddamn meteor hits the school. Like, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could, happen. Could happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Is like they went serial killer, then supernatural killer, and then they just went back to serial killer again. Like, if you're gonna change it up, like, like have someone else stabbing at the prom. Make it like a different like uh, like a horror anthology where it's a different yeah. kind of threat each each time. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, d- 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 Mummy at the prom. Yeah. Mummy at the prom. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he fucking starts dancing, and someone steps on his bandages. Yeah, yeah. Starts out <laughs> you can have some fun. Hilarious. Yeah, you know, yeah. Make, yeah, yeah, make it like an alien invasion or something. Make like the make the haunting at Hamilton High the franchise. And every every different iteration is a different like horror trope. <laughs> oh well. Prom night six, Chaperone Werewolf. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's why I don't create horror sequels. Well, horror sequels back in like the eighties, they always went to space. I don't know, like you remember right. Leprechaun, yeah. Jason, like they all just Prom went to space. space. There you go. I like it. You gotta <laughs> get, you gotta get the there eventually. Step. Yeah. You gotta get there eventually. So Alex escapes from from the prison. He gets the key. How did he get the keys? Oh, Mary Lou she, visits him as dis- disguised as a, like a sexy guard. She kills two cops with force lightning. Yep. Yeah, but she leaves. Uh, she <laughs> which leaves. I guess is a power she has. Well, I was just gonna say, where, what are her limits? It seems like she seems like it is none. She, <laughs> is, like, <laughs> she is like the most powerful movie monster that has ever existed. <laughs> in the in the second movie, she literally steps into a church. I didn't think demons could do that. I thought like they couldn't step on hollowed grounds. She is all powerful. Yeah. This. And to, the, the answer of the question is how she's able to step onto hallowed ground. Felt like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't really answer that. In any Wanted sort to. Of, yeah. yeah. So, Seemed like a good idea. So Alice escapes from the prison, and uh, he's got to go stop Mary Lou before she can kill Sarah. I'll tell you one of the things I, I really liked about this movie. Something I found really kind of um, what's the word? Cast. It's a simple word. You use it all the time. Uh, impressive. Uh, <laughs> is, welcome to my brain. Is I, I really like sort of like the the Evil Dead inspired tracking shot uh, of like I guess ghostly Mary Lou crashing down the hallway. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then she doing goes, sweet barrel rolls and shit. Yeah, yeah doing yeah. sweet barrel rolls, kind of uh, crashes through like an actual window. That and was, was uh, that, that was, was the real cool. that was the real money shot I felt of the movie. And they used it a couple of times. They did, and it, it looked pretty cheesy the first time I saw it. But like like as they kept doing it, like if she would whiz by people, and people were like, "Whoa, what was that?" So like we know she's she's invisible. So like yeah yeah i thought it was a neat effect and when it does crash through that that window it's like oh she's yeah she can she's invisible but she's also she, a physical she's presence. also physically yeah. affecting well you Ooh. see it in the very first part Ooh. of the movie with the janitor and Ooh. she flies past him he's like "Ooh, that's cool yeah <laughs> there's a lot of potential with uh, mary lou as a as, as a movie monster yeah, yeah. send her to space send her to space yeah. <laughs> get her up there yeah, if she ever joined the cast of Dead by Daylight, she would be a broken killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Unbalanced, yeah. OP. <laughs> what would her attributes be? What, like, what, what would her like her like skills be? Well, she could fly around the map at uh, you know high speeds. So just like one of the killers already, who can do that invisibly. Uh, one of the stronger killers. She can also force lightning, so uh, <laughs> she's also she's got range. You know, she can move really fast. She's got range. She can and, turn you into a Sunday. And her mori would be that she fucks you to death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, uh, she's also got like Meg Griffin nails in like one point yeah, where like her nails yeah. grow like really big, and she she never actually uses those. Meg but Griffin nails. Do you remember that one episode of Family Guy yeah, where, they, I know where you... they all got superpowers, but Meg could just grow her fingernails kind of long? Yeah, that's what she uh, does at one point. Okay, it was yeah. an interesting thing because it was almost like they're like, hey, it's kind of like Freddy, but she's not gonna do anything with it. Yeah, no. <laughs> she kidding? can do it though, so you yeah, can watch out. Yeah. <laughs> 
So the, the the prom goes off. Leonard and Sarah are going for like a walk on the like on the school grounds. After he does some sweet dance moves. <laughs> good, the, the good dance moves are the, they're good and bad dance moves. He seems to have he has some moves, yeah. but he doesn't really know how to tie it together. It, you know, it, it, he can my, moonwalk and then he does like a little chicken wing thing at one point. It, it was obviously the actor adding a, a little bit of Crispin Glover energy. It reminded me a lot of Crispin Glover in Friday the Fourteenth Four, mm. uh, particular his his dance break scene, which is great. You can you you should you. YouTube that. Just, yeah. just Crispin, Crispin Glover dancing in Friday the 13th Part 4. Yeah. So Mary Lou kills Leonard once she gets him away Which, from Sarah. Can I just say is the biggest shame of the movie. Mm. For She only up to that point has been killing people yeah. who has been inconveniencing her boyfriend totally. to some yeah. degree. It's against her MO. It's not only the fact that Leonard is like the best character of the movie, but like Leonard is on Alex's side. He he doesn't think he's the killer. He seems like a genuinely yeah. nice guy. Mm. And he's taking Sarah off of Alex's hands. So if anything, Mary Lou is deterring herself by taking him off the board. And what yeah, what's mm. interesting is like usually the guy in that role of the movie is like, Oh, you don't need that guy. Like I'm I'm awesome and I'll treat you right kind of thing. But there's none of that. You're just like, you know, that Alex is a good guy and I don't think he did any of this yeah. shit. She keeps shooting herself in the foot. She keeps making Alex get rid of the bodies when she could just get rid of them herself. Bit of an overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, prom queens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what wasn't elected prom queen because of her brain. Just... <laughs> How do they get to the underworld? <laughs> well, what happens is they they break up through the, the band stage. The band is playing. Yeah. They come up through it, and she's about to kill Sarah. They're yeah. about to kill her on stage, and that's when Alex jumps in. Mm. No, Yeah, don't take do me it. instead. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. Just leave Sarah alone. He had his gun there. He mm. fully intended to maybe kill this ghost demon mm. thing but then he's confronted with her finally after yeah. first of all walking through a crowd of people with a gun just like raised firing up in the air, yeah. and he fires it into the air in and the <laughs> middle of the prom <laughs> no one reacts and the way they should and everyone assumes that this guy's a fucking serial killer <laughs> and, but what's great is the line right after he's like don't worry guys I'm not gonna hurt anybody I'm just looking for my ex-girlfriend <laughs> who's here with another man <laughs> <laughs> this always ends well. Yeah. I, I just escaped from prison to deal with this one thing. I see there's some concern on faces around here. I just want to assure you, as he's waving, yeah, as he's waving. this gun around everywhere. <laughs> But he doesn't use the gun mm. on Mary Lou at that point. What, what point would there be? There's no, there's, you can't kill her with a well, gun. Well, he grabbed it in the first place. He didn't even try. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is true. He didn't try. He got there and he's like, you know what? I'm going to go to hell with you. And this is maybe the only continuity nod to Prom Night 2 is right before they descend into hell. Mary Lou says uh, a line from Prom Night 2, which is, uh, I'm trying to remember it. It's, it's not who you show up with it's who you go home with yes yeah yeah that's sort of like the only uh, carryover line i guess it's yeah. kind of meant to be her catchphrase yeah uh, but she never got another movie so uh, uh, it didn't really, uh, didn't really damn over. damn shame here yeah. yeah yeah so she takes him to the upside down sarah manages to, to follow them she goes through the portal before uh before it closes, and they are in this hellish, zombified version of the school where all of Mary Lou's victims are there in zombie form, but also like their most negative personality trait forms. Like Shane's there; she's Shane's the first person who Sarah sees, and uh, he's like, "He's better off without you. Like, get out of this." He's a real realm. asshole. He's no longer the supportive, clingy best friend he had been throughout the whole movie. Yeah, Leonard seems unaffected. <laughs> Leonard he seems... was. <laughs> he was... Same with Andrew the Bully, yeah. <laughs> they still seem to have a schedule. Andrew the Bully, if anything, seems a little nicer now. <laughs> hell, hell does some things to yeah. people. It changes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did laugh quite a bit. The the three of them are trying to break down the door and, and, and get to Sarah, and, and uh, the other two are just sort of, you know, like, Sarah, Sarah, and like, God God bless Leonard, and he's just kind of like, Sarah, we have to stick to the schedule, and he's just like, <laughs> he's talking just a little louder than the other two, so yeah. uh, I love this guy. Well, this guy's I mean, great. The, the point yeah. I'm, I'm making is that, like, they are in, like, the thrall in the service of Mary Lou. I don't know how yes. she has like any kind of dominion over the people at this school. I don't I don't know what her powers are per se, you yes, know. It's but, not yeah. But now they are all in in the servitude of Mary Lou in the in this fucking zombified state. And and like it, she's back in hell and oh. she seems to have dominion over a bunch of lost souls who are all members of the prom. They're all guests of the prom. They're all like dressed up and they're all like, "Oh, Mary Lou and everything." The last time we saw her in hell, she was literally in chains. Mm. So, yeah. you, you, how does hell work? Yeah. Well, yeah. it looks like if you break out of hell and then come back to hell, you get to kind of run things a little bit. I guess it, maybe Satan doesn't know she's back yet. 
Satan, she came in through the back door. Satan mm. runs a very loose ship, I think. Mm. <laughs> just, hell, there aren't a whole lot of rules in hell. You know, this is your room. Yeah. Just, you know, clean it up. Keep the temperature down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little joke. Uh, <laughs> <that's> a little... <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch the thermostat. <laughs> Don't touch the thermostat. <laughs> so, so Sarah MacGyver's herself a, a sweet fucking flamethrower, which, like, she destroys Leonard and Andrew and, and Shane with it, and then she's off to find Mary Lou, but she runs afoul of this jukebox sentry, which shoots uh, some buzz saws at her. <laughs> she, Movie, movies, horror movies in the 80s and 90s. They really, were so much fun. <laughs> they really loved the idea of, like, dangerous discs. It was yeah. the Wild West back then. Yeah. They were like, what if a jukebox? Yeah. Hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the jukebox shows up early, and, and, and in Prom Night 2, there's this um, sort of, like, sentient chest of drawers yeah. that, like, is kind of, like, I guess holds Mary Lou's soul or whatever. Yeah, it, it keeps, keeps all, like, the, the mementos, like her sash and yeah. her crown. It keeps coming there. back, and, like, in the first scene with the janitor, the jukebox shows up and I, I th started thinking like oh her soul is in a, a jukebox now mm. but it only shows up at the beginning and then right at the end yeah and it doesn't end up becoming a thing and anyways like it destroys the hose of the flamethrower so now like we know that that's not going to work for uh, for the confrontation with uh, Mary Lou which is really too bad because they do set up a really fucking awesome yippee ki -yay line I love the you know what I actually loved that line yeah probably the best part of the movie but then followed up by a big letdown. Yeah, because yeah. you can't do it. And, like, and it's, it's like, just... engulf Mary Lou in flames yes. again. Yes! And or then nothing least, happens. Just least... let, let all the air out of the scene. Yeah. Which I guess maybe was the intention because this is meant to be a con like a horror parody. But yeah. it didn't read that way. Subverting expectations. It's just so disappointing. Just because it's a comedy, you still need to have the big hurrah moment at the end. Yeah. 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 And those zombies... They were so patient and polite. Like she just, <laughs> she just walked through them, and mm. they just, they just stood back. They're like, "Yeah, have your monologue." Mm. Literally, how do they kill Mary Lou? I watched the movie two days ago, and I don't <sighs> remember her. Mary Lou in, in in this scene. Oh yeah, yeah. what yeah. happens? Yeah, is okay. So you have you have Alex sitting strapped to the the prom king chair or whatever. She's about to lower a drill helmet onto his head. Into drills. And by the way, he doesn't have nearly enough concern on his head. It looks mm. like he's just waiting for a shot. He's yeah. like, oh, this is going to be Are bad. you surprised yeah. at this point? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but before that's about to happen, she she like tries, she has the line, and then the flamethrower doesn't work. She jumps up on stage. She shoves it into her chest. Yeah, she takes she the blowtorch, and she puts it like down her... Down her shirt, and like pushes her into a seat. And she, she just... Has enough time to take it out, but she instead just screams, "Ah!" Yeah, right. It. Okay. And then yeah. it explodes. Yeah. And, uh, then... and then they try to make their escape through uh, through the underworld. I don't know fucking how they think they're gonna do it, but um... car. Yeah, well, that, that's, how, that's how it happens. But it's like you're in like foreign territory. You are like in this supernatural netherworld. I I wouldn't know how the fuck to get out of it. But they're just they're just trying anything, right? Yeah. If there's a highway to hell, it makes sense that there's a highway out, out of hell. hell. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take the off ramp here. So they go to like the the auto shop and uh, they get into this car. She manages to hotwire. Fucking Sarah, like MVP of this fucking movie. Yeah. You know, she's fucking almost up. like she should have been the protagonist. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. She should have been in more of the movie, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like showing concern of like what's happening with her boyfriend. We should not have followed Alex through this. Like, he's a very unlikable character. Yeah. Uh, he's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. He's terrible. Yeah. So, anyways, Mary Lou is not quite dead. So they have to run her over with the car and that transports them back to the real world mm -hmm. uh we're now like they say they're home free even though fucking alex is a wanted man <laughs> yeah they're yeah. They, they seem totally fine despite the fact that he, he has escaped from prison and multiple people think that he and he shot up the prom and yeah, yeah. There, there are some <laughs> repercussions he can expect upon returning yeah. and then this ending is is a real this ending more than anything made me think of fucking are you afraid of the dark this is the, <laughs> oh this my is the god same, this is the exact same deus ex machina bullshit that that show pulled all the time that as soon as this 
over, you're all like, wait, fucking what? What, what is happening? It, so it turns out that, like, they're they're back on Earth, but it's, like, the 1950s, mm. which is when, which is the era that Mary Lou is from, mm. but, like, also, no one can see or hear them, mm. but Mary Lou is also there, mm. and she kills Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's the end. That's the end. That's, that's, that's it. Well, yeah. And then he stands out in the middle of the parking lot trying to get people's attention, but of course they can't see him. Mm. Yeah. And like he's uh, fucking Ebenezer Scrooge or yeah. some shit. And he yeah. has what I can only describe as the like a nervous breakdown. <laughs> like, well, you win, it. Mary Lou. <laughs> I, I assume the director was like, okay, this is where you finally like lose your marbles. And he's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I'm that like, was you... the 30th take. That was the best one. I'm yeah. going to have to give the most average performance of my life. <laughs> uh, and that's it. That's the movie. That's so the were, were, there movie. Any, were there any uh, the bits and bobs that we didn't talk about that, that we want to mention here? So one thing I wanted to, to bring up. Um, I wanted to know the name of the rap song that plays as uh, as the credits roll. Oh yeah, how fucking jarring is that ending? She's gonna freak ya by Maestro Fresh West. <laughs> I, I stuck through the whole credits to find that. But the thing I really wanted to bring up was during the credits, there's like a Alex drives a motorcycle in the in this movie, correct? They have a credited heart. Oh, sorry, correct. Sorry, sorry. I know you were waiting. Man. <laughs> yes. they, they have a credited Harley Wrangler, and his name was Jake. Live to ride, fry. Now I want to find a fucking picture of that guy. <laughs> get, a doc, get a documentary uh, wow. on, on this guy, man. Uh, Jake, live to ride, fry. Professional Harley Wrangler to the stars. Legal you... name? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he even shows up in IMDb, because it's not like, oh, Jake Fry, as Jake, live to ride, fry. Uh, his credits are this movie and Darkman 2, The Return of Durant. Fuck yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, another person who was just into sequels. <laughs> Birds of a feather, right? <laughs> okay, so back on the scene, uh, we love talking about with his little sister coming and sure. like coming to see our favorite, our favorite thing to talk about. Our yeah, thing to talk about. So in that moment, Alex comes to his friend and he's like, "Hey, here's what's been happening with me: the demon girl, yada yada, ruining my life, killed lots of people." Oh. He's like, damn, that's tough, dude. And then there's a there's a knock at the door. He's like, oh, I'll go get that. And it's his little sister. He he doesn't like, oh, hey, your little sister's here. Well, he's asleep. He, he, I think he passed out drunk. Oh, yeah, he yeah. passes out in the back seat. And, and Shane lovingly puts his jacket over top of him, <laughs> even though he is sleeping on his deck. Yeah. Which is a weird place to let your friend fall asleep. Near the pool. Near the how, pool. How unsafe is that? Yeah, you're gonna, yeah, exactly. Yeah, what if he's a sleepwalker? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought they were going to use the pool somehow in this death scene, because, like, in a, like you were saying, like the nail file thing, usually when you see something prominent, mm -hmm. you know, there's a focus in a scene... It is somehow used in the horror movie element. Well, but Shane's death was set up earlier on in a line of dialogue when he's in oh. the car with Alex and he says, When I go, I want it to be on my parents' lightly. Oh, shut up, Shane. I, it's the most obvious fucking thing in the world. It, he says, like, when I die, I want to die on my parents' white rug and I want it to be gory. Mm. And it's just like, it's is that, Wait, is that what he says? That's what he says, says like, verbatim, yeah. yeah. Wow. And then that's, like, literally what happens. It's just all like, Okay, I guess we know how Shane is going to die now. <laughs> what an odd, oddly specific yeah, and morbid what, thing to say. I know, right? What an odd thing to say to your friend. Yeah, it's almost like you're sending yourself up to be in a bad horror movie. <laughs> and Mary Lou only came and delivered on that. She's like, hey, you remember the other day how you said you wanted to die in a gory way on your... I'm here to offer my services. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Lou wasn't even there at the time, so how would she have known that he said that? Ghost powers. She's on yes, the I guess never. she's all these. She's, she's the most the powerful thing in the, in the universe. That is true. Yes. <laughs> she's God. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, why, which is why she's in hell? Yeah, it's Mary Lou's world we're just living in. It. <laughs> so two little bits of trivia that I want to point out, because this this movie, as as we have uncovered, is just a, a treasure trove of, of weird, random facts. This movie has one of our favorite stock characters. It has the wacky cop yep. that he, oh, um, right. that he uh, kidnaps by gunpoint. And has, 
maybe one of my favorite exchanges because uh, uh, I'm burying the bodies and he's kind of like the younger cop and he sounded like one of them was filled with fruit. What do you mean fruit? You know, fruit, bananas, cherries, fruit, stuff like that. And then uh, when uh, Alex sneaks up behind him and steals uh, the cop car and forces him to drive him to prom, uh, he has the great line delivery of just like, I just have one question. Why, why fruit? Why fruit? <laughs> you know what? That was the most real line in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Well, this actor has a bit of background for uh, delivering good lines uh, in this franchise because this actor is uh, Brock Simpson who is the only actor to appear in all four Prom Night movies. Really? really? But he always plays a different character in every single one. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, I like I like things like that. So that's like <laughs> a weird little feather in his cap. Yeah, a nice little cameo. Oh, for, yeah. yeah. Like, like Cheech Marin in Dust Till Dawn. That's right. Is he in the, uh, the sequels as well too? I don't, well, I don't know if he's in the sequels, but I mean specifically in From Dust Till Dawn, he plays like five characters. He plays like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Good for him. Yeah. Good for him. The other, the other bit of uh, trivia, that uh, this, this is wild. This is on the uh, IMDb uh, trivia thing here. Uh, this film was financed by Live Entertainment, uh, which was owned by Jose Menendez. Does that name sound familiar? Uh, does that familiar to Jameson? Oh, fuck. Corey, do you know who we're talking about? No, no, no. Okay, so let me finish the uh, trivia thing. Oh, the I, if it's who I'm thinking of. The Thursday before production was to commence, writer-director Ron Oliver went to dinner with the Menendez family, including mm -hmm. brothers Eric yep. and Lyle. The following Monday, Ron learned production had been delayed due to the murders of Jose and Kitty Menendez by their sons. By the Menendez brothers. The Menendez brothers, the Menendez family, what? financed this. This movie was financed by an actual murder victim. What? Yeah. <laughs> How fucking wild is that? God. That is so fucked up. How, <laughs> why, <laughs> How does that affect you to such a point that you're like, well, you know what? This is my life now. I think I just have to support everything that falls into this genre, even though it <laughs> fucking brings back right. horrible memories. Right off the bat, this is a cursed production. <laughs> oh my god. God. Wow! It just reaffirms the fact that, like, I just I want to have dinner with Ron Oliver so bad. It sounds like he has so many stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, this guy's you know, fascinating. You know, my 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 family they all died by overindulging on sweets, so I decided to make Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. You know, right. that's the same kind of. <laughs> I, I, I can't wrap my mind around that. That's, that's, that's wild. A, wow. Yeah, that's a weird little bit of trivia. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Corey, Jamison, would you recommend Prom Night 3, The Last Kiss? You know what? I actually would. I, I it's, it's one of those movies where you're not going in expecting an Oscar performance. And trust me, you're not going to get one. <laughs> but it, if, you, if what you want is, is, like, basically what you want out of most horror movies from that genre from that era even, to just be wild and wacky and full of stupid gore, then that's exactly what you're going to get. You know, I'm kind of on the fence, to be honest. I think, I don't know, come back to me. <laughs> but the thing is, is like for me, a defining movie where it separates from good bad to bad bad mm -hmm. is I have to, if it makes me actually genuinely laugh, and it mm. did make me genuinely laugh a couple times, even though, like, it was absurd shit. But mm. I think that's the point. You know, I, it's interesting because I saw three before I saw two. And for the third one, like, I, I, I kind of had this nagging thought in the back of my head that, like, this seems like this was, like, a step backwards in, like, production budget. So it looked a little ch too cheap for my mind. And I kept thinking, you know, with, like, the high watermark that uh, that Kaz set for, for two, like, I'm I, sure I that was... It up a bit. I, I'm sure that was just, like, a mind-blowingly fantastic, fantastic movie. And I was kind of like, okay, so I'm watching one... Of, I'm watching the lesser sequel of a great, underappreciated Diamond in the Rough kind of cult classic. I'm gonna have to say, like, because I thought two was actually just a little dull... Maybe I do recommend three just because like it has like a a, a livelier pace to it and it, there is like enough of like the goofy campy elements into it. I will say though that it is a shame that uh, that Lisa did not come back as um uh, as Mary Lou because I think she's a she's she's a better actress. I mean she had to fucking kiss Michael Ironside in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a good character and I think the horror movie franchises would benefit having like this character like be a recurring uh, uh figurehead in uh, in horror cinema. Yeah. So, like, every couple of years is a new prom night movie. Yeah. Ooh. Like, I'm sure, like, Lisa Schrage probably goes to, like, horror conventions every now and then and, like, signs some stuff. Because Prom Night 2 is a, a bit of a cult film. It, it's just a shame that she doesn't have, like, a couple of them. Yeah. You know, to, to have under her belt. Because, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the Doug Bradleys and, and the Gunnar Hansons of the world, they, they have, like, uh, you know, this cult following or whatnot. And, it, you know, it's like... She obviously really liked playing that role, mm. and for Courtney Taylor, this kind of just seemed like a job. 
uh, to get through. Uh, even mm-hmm. though she's not the worst, she's just kind just, of okay. And that's kind of how yeah. I feel about the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I yeah. will say that uh, when I watched these for the first time last year, you know, I, obviously I watched two and then three. And I think I was a little I, I was a little higher on three because I was coming off of the buzz of two and I was really enjoying two. Yeah. And three, I kind of felt like, well, it's not as good, but, you know, there's, like, there's some good stuff here. I think I've, I've kind of kind of softened on three a little bit. I, I feel like the, the main word here is half-baked. You know, yeah. I, I think if you compartmentalize it a little bit more, like, you know, this, you throw it in with the category of movies that are good, bad movies, I think the reason why it's tough to make a call is because in that specific category, it's on the lower end of good and bad yeah, movies. Sure. You know what I think it is in two, having seen it, like there are some good like practical kills done like in the school mm-hmm. setting. Whereas this one, like you're really just kind of resorting to Mary Lou being Freddy Krueger and uh, and not being great at it. Yeah, I think modern sequels would have her like kind of lean more towards like the slasher villain, but like she works a little better as like a possessive ghost kind of character who like embodies people and enchants people when she's just like left there to be like all right so the main focus of like the kill in this scene is that it's Mary Lou and you know if you don't have like a really strong presence it's not going to completely work yeah I think so but I, th- I think you know like Mary Lou is overdue for a, a resurgence Absolutely. you know like Lisa Strange is still around so you can cast her as a cameo yeah. as like the principal or something like that you know like they already rebooted Prom Night once you know like the, the current trend of like rebooting horror movies is like movies that only follow the continuity of some of the sequels but not <laughs> all of them so like there's lots of examples of, of why a Mary Lou centric prom Prom Night remake could work. You yeah. could just literally just call it like Prom Night. You don't need to add the two or any sort of like subtitle. Just bring back the idea of a supernatural prom queen ghost and have her kill people and yeah. go hog wild. And, is that uh, so it, much to ask? Is that? Yeah. Uh, is, 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 can we get that? <laughs> it practically writes that, itself. Like... <laughs> thanks, thanks, Biden. All right. <laughs> All right. Corey Bolio, thank you so much for uh, hey. coming on the show. Uh, do you have anything that you want to plug or anything that you want to recommend that you've seen le- recently or read or listened to? Well, uh, self-plug here. If I do highly recommend you check out my Twitch channel and YouTube channel, mm-hmm. both under the name of Corey Cola. And do feel free to follow me on Twitter as well. Oh, yes. very, very uh, I will uh, also uh, just add on to that. Uh, if you're looking for Corey Cola, that's all one word because I was looking for Corey Cola this morning and I couldn't find it. I kept getting uh, some other Corey Cola. Damn it! Uh, so oh, no. uh, you might, I don't know, you might want to bring up some Corey Dr. Pepper! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Cola. I believe maybe. it was Corey Cola Jr. So I felt like maybe it was like a spin off of uh, no, Corey Cola. No relation. Diet Corey Cola. No, no, no relation. No relation. No relation. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Jameson, what do you recommend this week? Uh, I got some. Uh, uh, three quick recommendations here. Uh, currently, the uh, the Vancouver Improv Fest is going on, and my sister is in an improv troupe. It's called uh, Board of Directors. Yeah, go check that out if you're if you're in Vancouver and you're into the improv scene. Speaking of which, uh, Sin Peaks improvised weekly soap opera oh. uh, every week at the Havana. I might also be a part of that. Uh, you, no. You'd have to come by to see. Are you guys streaming any episodes of that, or is it just all in person, all live? We're all we're all just in person. We audio record it, but that's mainly mm. ourselves. Right. That's okay. Scary. Cool. So if you're not in Vancouver, you're out of luck. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Most of you are in Vancouver, though, I imagine. <laughs> the, all three of you. Yeah. Uh, the other two things I wanted to say uh, very quickly, um, the Red Letter Media guys, who are big inspirations for me and like what like we do here, uh, they recently just wrapped up a three-part filmography discussion on the movies of John Carpenter. That's... Boy, I have, I have, I'm taking some umbrage on some of their choices. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally expected. And the thing I wanted to recommend on, uh, on Netflix here is a, uh, it's one of their documentaries, one of their untold documentaries. It's called Crime and Penalties. It's about like a minor league hockey team that was purchased by a mafioso for his son to run. And it's a very, very interesting story because like the team was just, you know, like they absolutely gooned it up, but they just like cleaned up their minor league that they played in. That sounds so familiar. I, I'm somewhat familiar with that. With yeah. the, with the, Danbury Trashers, they were called. Yes. Yeah. They um. They, they, it's it's an interesting story, and what I found very compelling was that even though like this uh like this guy was clearly a, like a like part like of the mafia, he seems like a very endearing family guy, and uh and and he gets along well with his son, and his son for being as much of a 
you know, bro douchebag as he seems, he, he managed a very successful hockey team, and it really endeared themselves to the people. So you kind of don't really know what to think of these guys, because it's the brutal goonery hockey, and yet, like, they were super successful and, you know, fan favorites, and uh, these guys were clearly in a part of organized crime, and yet they are, like, they're doing so much good for the community, and they seem to, like, genuinely care for each other. It's a, it's a very interesting watch, and I recommend that. Right on. Cool. In lieu of a recommendation this week, I want to give a eulogy. Uh, I want to give a eulogy to uh, a mobile game, uh, Dr. Mario World Online, which, um, no joke, is a, a mobile game that I have played every single day since the pandemic started. And uh, at the end of this month, Nintendo is going to uh, stop supporting it because it apparently is not as financially successful as their <laughs> other mobile games. And uh, the hours and hours of work and a little bit of real world money that I have put into it is essentially going to be uh, wiped clean and it will only be available as uh, I, I could still access the app uh, but I will only be able to uh, see a, a snapshot of my stats. So it will, be, uh, it will literally be a, a graveyard uh, after this app. Uh, but just like the ability to hop online and play like one-on-one -on -one Dr. Mario with like someone in Japan really helped me kind of open up meagerly back when we were all trapped and terrified and, and unable to go anywhere. Uh, and it's the first time I've ever genuinely been pissed off in Nintendo about something. Uh, so so, like remake if you remake that for the switch i will buy a switch like like the next day i'm such a fan of that game i'm so bummed i i just this morning i unlocked kind of the main reason i downloaded the game in the first place which was uh, i unlocked uh doctor uh, three goombas in a lab coat uh <laughs> who actually isn't that good of a character but it took me this long to get him so i'm gonna use you know him what every you, time. Ach you achieved your goal yeah. and th at the end of the day that's what's important so i only have 15 days left to enjoy that <laughs> so by the time you hear that that will be dead don't mourn that it's lost like appreciate that it happened. appreciate the time that it was here <laughs> and I'll, I'll need to find a new it, it, it literally is going offline the day i start my vacation and the day after my birthday so thanks well, for yeah, that. Yeah, you get to enjoy your vacation all right well that was prom night three the last kiss directed by peter simpson and sir ronald robert oliver oms <laughs> <laughs> if you like this episode may his reign be eternal <laughs> 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 Glory be to his name. <laughs> if you like this episode, please follow us on Instagram at the F is this podcast and Twitter at the T underscore is this. Look for us on Facebook at the fuck is this. Watch us on YouTube if you're hearing this episode on Spotify. And if you are watching this episode on YouTube, do the opposite of that. Uh, Jameson, take us out. All right. So here's a line that uh, that Alex says when he's on the phone with his parents and he wants to get off the line so he pretends that Shane is talking to him. We got to fly like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? That's, that's a good one. Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, how about this? Like, it, it's not who you show up with, it's who you go home with. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going home solo. Oh, wait, I just remembered the other... I'm sorry, I, those are both good, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna... I'm gonna be an asshole. I'm, I'm gonna take this away from you, even though it's literally the one thing I let you do. Everything, but I just remember... Can I give it... I'll give it to you, and then you say it, because it is the other line that carries over from from the second movie it's the other kind of like holdover line so i'll say it to you i'll cut it out of the episode and then it'll sound like you came up with it okay okay <laughs> it's perfect because it's the perfect sign off can i guess what it is yeah is it see you later alligator see you later alligator all right all right i guess now we all have to do it all right <laughs> all right see, see you, you later, later alligator, alligator. <laughs>